And now, everyone, put your hands together and give a warm welcome to the one, the only, Monique Mo Mason. All right, all right. What's up, everybody? Can you guys hear me? Everybody hear me? All right, cool. All right, so I know we're running a little bit behind, so let me hurry up and get everybody in here. Up first, I call him my little brother all the time, mix engineer, Hall of Fame 2 inductee, my man, Leslie Brathwaite. Next to you. you sit next to me, sir. I feel like I'm at the principal. <laughs> uh, next up, producer, engineer, stage manager, production manager, 6 7 Music, Tremaine 6 7 Williams Hall of Fame 9 inductee. <laughs> and last but not least, Hall of Fame 6 inductee. Recording and mix engineer, Carlton Lynn. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Hi, gentlemen. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Is everybody enjoying Hall of Fame 13 so far? Yeah. Right on. All right, so let's just go ahead and dive in. So um, obviously we're talking about mu uh, money today, and I guess... The first place I would like to start is if you guys were just coming out of Full Sail now, how would you approach kicking off your career and approaching clients? Um, okay, I'll go first. Okay. Um, I think the approach would be um, having the mentality that I'm not coming out of school and I'm a rock star and I'm going to get a whole lot of money and da da da. It, it would be more about trying to make myself valuable in the spaces that I'm in, um, trying to understand that sometimes the currency isn't money, but it's um, uh, learning, being in situations where you can learn, where you can meet people. So my mentality would be, my approach would be just try to get in the rooms, try to learn, try to work. If I do have opportunities to make money, understand that it's probably not going to be the amount of money that I really want or think that I'm worth. And then it's about making sure I put certain um, things in place, like if I'm working with a client, even if it's a little bit of money, um, certain principles like, okay, well, give me half up front, let me do my work, and then you pay me the other half when I finish. That way, if they stiff me or if they get locked up or any of these, yeah. you know, a million reasons, yeah. at least I got something for my work. So it's those kind of things that you try to implement, even at a small level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll say uh, now since studios aren't such a big thing, um, kind of try to, I know you got to like take care of now, but also try to think long term because a, a question we always get is, you know, how do I get in with these big artists? And most engineers that are locked in with a big artist started with them when they were small. So you have to remember this is the time when you're starting, they start and y'all grow together, you build together then they don't want to work with anybody else but you. That's your built-in check. That's job security. So just keep that in mind as you're not going to, because there's not enough studios anymore. So you can't just be like, I'm going to go intern at a studio. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind you might have to get a side job or whatever to keep the lights on. But also, if you find the artist you believe in as an engineer, producer, whatever, you know, take that leap and grow with them and think long-term, four or five years from now, if they blow and you're right there with them, Y'all, it's a joint venture. They're not going to do anything without you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully, if I'm getting out of school now, hopefully I've done my job and kind of networked while I was in school. And so when I'm done, graduated, I'm going to reach out to my network and try to find out you know, if there's somewhere, someone has some kind of need. They have a void. Uh, they need some kind of skill, somewhere I can fit, I can fit in. That's what I'm going to do is just get on, get on, the, get on the horn and find where I can, I can get in, you know? Mm -hmm. Tremaine, Tremaine, you mentioned, um, you know, finding a side job, and, you know, a little side hustle to keep money coming in. One of the things that I often encourage students to do, especially um, because even though, uh, you know, there's recording arts and then there's audio production, 
um, and music production, but there's a lot of audio work in television. And I know a lot of you want to go work in studios, but you just heard Tremaine say there, there you know, there aren't a lot of studios. What are your What are your thoughts about looking into television work, work doing audio for TV? Um, so I think what like 2010. So I graduated 2004. I didn't really dive into TV until 2010 or 11, and I got pushed into it by my mentor at the time. Um, and we just all ended up on a Sunday Best show together. But I was his engineer for a while. Mm -hmm. And it naturally progressed to, he was like, well, we're going to go do this music show, which was Sunday Best, which is like the gospel American Idol. We need a playback guy. You're my engineer. You know Pro Tools. You know how I move, how I operate. You're also a musician, so you think like the rest of us. So we're just going to use you as our Pro Tools guy. And it just naturally became a thing. And then it just... Like, that's just what it is now. I'm just Pro Tools guy for TV shows, for award shows, whatever. Um, and that's a whole other check that I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And that is a really nice check because <laughs> I do award shows quarterly. And that, like, that covers my mortgage alone, mm. just doing those shows. That's and then students from here, Vakisha, I always bring her up. Mm -hmm. She was always here when we were in Audio Temple or whatever. Vakisha was always here, always asking the right questions or not asking questions. Because mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. you just be quiet and watch. Say it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and when Vakisha got out, she ended up working at Generation Now, is where Les is at a lot. And then uh, I pulled her in for some stuff, for some TV stuff. And now I'm sending Vakisha out on gigs that I don't do for TV stuff to do playback. Because mm -hmm. I know she knows Pro Tools. I prep a lot of the sessions. But, you know, when you're in there in the room with the people... You just got to be on the fly and do these edits real quick. And as long as you know music and you know your DAW, you can move quick. And that's a huge check that you didn't even think about because you're just so focused on music, music, music. It's still music just in a different environment. Absolutely. So you're sending her out on these gigs as freelance? As, as me. She's the playback engineer. So who's negotiating the rate? So you so already me, negotiate it, and then you just send her out. Me and my production partner are, he's the music director, I'm the music producer for most of these shows. Mm -hmm. And we have, the production company gives us the music budget, and we look at how many people we have to hire, background singers, band, whatever. And then uh, we pay ourselves, obviously, and built into that, when, when it was time to hire Vakisha, because it was too much work on me for some shows, mm -hmm. when she's with me during the show, we told the production company we needed, I needed an assistant engineer because I'm not going to stay up till 6 a.m. every day doing edits when she could be doing them beside me while I'm working on the next song. Mm -hmm. And when she came in, I'm going to bed at like midnight now. Like she's saving me so much time just because there's, there's time for her to do it while I'm working on something else. And so it made all the sense in the world to be able to get this stuff done. One question I get a lot from students is, what do I charge? <laughs> what, you know, and I want everybody to answer this one, please, is how do you tell <laughs> new people going into the industry where to start? You know, one of my biggest, I will tell you this, one of my biggest things I tell them is don't put your rate online. No. Um, don't broadcast your rate because it's going to be different for every project. If you've not been in my class, just know that I'm going to tell you that. Um, so how do they go about creating their rate? So I think there's a couple of different um, mindsets about it. I think the first thing is you check in with your cohort, check in with your friends, your peers, check in with people who are doing the same thing or who may be getting a little more traction than you but are kind of at the same pace you are and see what they're charging, see what they're getting. Um, kind of think about the, the level of client that is coming to you. A lot of times early in your career, it's going to be people kind of on your same level. So you're going to have to kind of deal with lower rates, um, Again, the, the currency and the thing that's most important isn't always the money. It's about the experience. It's about learning. So you got to always have that mentality as well. And then as you kind of grow and kind of start, you know, making some moves, there are different ways to kind of go about that particular conversation. A lot of times I always say you kind of you can kind of see what's going on. Like if somebody pulls up to me in a Rolls Royce, you're not getting the discount. 
you know, <laughs> you're driving a Rolls Royce. So then I know what kind of budgets I'll be talking. Uh, cool technique I use personally, I still use it now, and I think it even applies even earlier in your career. Let them say a figure first just to kind of see where their head is. Because sometimes, and more often than not, that figure is a lot more or a little more than you were going to say. So a lot of times it can work out to your advantage to kind of let them, you feel it out, see what they say. And when they, yeah, I've, I've had those situations where somebody will say a crazy number, I'll be like, sure, all right. <laughs> and, and then I have to act like, okay, yeah, I could do it for that. And meanwhile, in my head, I'm like, well, man, he willing to pay that? Okay. So let them kind of, you know, feel that out and just go from there. And then sometimes if they say a number that's way too low, then you say, well, usually I charge this. And then see if y'all can meet in the middle. It's always about, you know, just trying to see, feel it out. And every, like um, when you said, every situation is different. Um, and you just kind of feel out the conversations, the vibes, the, you know, again, look at what they're wearing. Look at, you, you know, look at what you're driving. You know, you pull up in a certain type of car, you, you already know what you're dealing with. And also learn, you know, I, I don't know that everybody in here plays poker, but there's something called a tell when you play cards. Um, and so to Leslie's point, even if that number is amazing, you don't show that you're excited. Absolutely. <laughs> like, just play it off. Stay cool. You know, this is business as usual. Um, so you don't give yourself away. So y'all going to have to work on your, your poker face. Too. Yep. <laughs> so I was, and just to add on to what Leslie's saying, and if someone doesn't give you a number and doesn't want to, talk about what their budget they're working with at the beginning, they're probably not serious. So mm -hmm. that's why it, that's real. it's good to try to get a number out of somebody in, in the beginning. Yeah. And, and later on, like, I think all of us now, we have a number that we will not do any work for. Like, there's right. a bottom number where you're just like, like for me, for tour stuff, I have a number where I'm not leaving my house if I don't get this amount of money per week. Period. I don't care what the gig is. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten some huge calls, and I was like, not for that number. <laughs> like, you got to come up with some more. This artist is huge. If you're not going to pay me my number, I'm not. Because the stress later on, you're going to be upset that you took that gig and you're not getting the money that you wanted. Mm -hmm. yep. And that, that doesn't do anything for you. You're just going to regret doing it. So just after a while, not right now when you start now, but you'll hit this point where you're just like, no way I'm doing any work for less than this number. Yep. And that's an indication that you know what your worth is. Yeah, yeah. So, again, another question that I get is, how do I determine my worth? How do you answer that question? Um, I think a lot of times your worth kind of ends up kind of determining itself. And what I mean by that is a lot of times you you kind of know. you Like, for instance, if you come up with a number and you say, okay, like Tremaine said, if you say, I'm not taking less than this, right? And then you notice all the people you negotiate with the next five times go, yeah, we're not paying that. Maybe you're not worth that. And so maybe you need to kind of back off in your head and realize, because now, just like Tremaine said, if you're saying, hey, I'm not doing anything for less, for more, less than this, nine times out of ten, he is getting more than that on most of the other gigs. Now, if you're never getting that, or, and, and you have, you know what I'm saying? If, if all the time everybody goes, yeah, we're not paying that, you might not be worth that. You know what I mean? So then you got to kind of just kind of see what the world and, and the universe is giving you as well. You got to kind of be realistic about what you're getting. Mm -hmm. You can't be unrealistic. Mm -hmm. and, and like he said, it's talking to your peers and understanding what the marketplace is as well. Because me and Les will have conversations. Mm -hmm. I know his rate. And so, honestly, like, when I found out his rate, I bumped mine a little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was like, I know I'm not getting what he's getting, right? But I, when I, after we had that conversation, I was like, I should be asking for a little more. Mm -hmm. Like, I do have some experience. And I've worked with these artists. And when I say these names to these people, the artist that wants me to do whatever fans out a little bit. So I'm like, I have a little leverage here absolutely, to, to push my rate up. So it's talking to your peers and figuring out what the marketplace is and being somewhere in there and, and knowing where you sit in the marketplace as well. Cause Absolutely. I'd be dumb to be out here demanding his prices mm -hmm. without his resume. Mm -hmm. Yours ain't no slouch either, though. <laughs> no, you, got, you, got some, you got some stuff on your resume. Yeah. Yeah. Carlton, you want to add anything? No. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, they got it. 
Um, how willing are other engineers or um, other industry professionals willing to actually disclose what they're charging? Pretty much. I mean, the, the beautiful thing, I mean, Carlton, I tell you, he and I are friends and me and Tremaine are friends. And the beautiful thing is, is a lot of us, most of us in, in these fields, the engineers, the producers, we're all friends. And we don't, tip, the ones of us with healthy mentalities, we don't look at each other as competition. I never look at, you know, my peers as competition. We all have our own. Nobody can mix a record the way I mix a record. And that's not an ego thing. That's just a, I'm an individual. I'm a unique person. I can't do what Carlton does. I can't do what Tremaine does. So we all kind of know that and respect that, and we support each other. We throw each other work sometimes when we can't do something. And we just, it, it really, I could call Carlton and be like, hey, man, what you charging for mixes these days? And he's going to tell me, or Guru, or Manny Mariquin, or all the top engineers. We all, it, there's no egos, and there's no hiding, and we all kind of know what we all make, and everybody knows what serving charges, and everybody know what so and so charges. It's, it's just, and there, and you will have those toxic people in any industry that will be like, "Nah, I'm not telling y'all what I charge," and da da da. But you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm somewhat of a uh, spiritual being, so I believe in God and what God put on my plate. Can't nobody take off my plate, so I ain't worrying about it. That's real. I'm good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, my my cheat code, honestly, is since I do production as well and I don't want to mix all my production stuff I can make that call to other engineers because I'm actually calling them to see how much like because I'm gonna have to talk to a label and I'll be like well I want this guy to mix it so I'm finding out rates through that and sometimes they'll give me the love rate just because they're the homie yeah but I'm also finding out the marketplace of like oh, okay you charging this much this much so that kind of helps me on my side like Tremaine hired me to mix a record remember yeah. the record uh, <laughs> are you up <laughs> <laughs> Tremaine hired the, the record itself was hilarious, but <laughs> Tremaine hired me to mix a record, and yeah, and, and and of course I'm gonna look out for him and not overcharge him and not kill him with the rape. But at the same time, he got me, he got me some paper. Yeah, yeah, he got me paid. So, um, I'm gonna guess, or I, I know I shouldn't assume, but I'm going to for the purposes of this conversation, that all of you or most of you are using an accountant at this stage. So my first half of this question is, at what point did you guys create legal entities that you were collecting your, that you began collecting your, your revenue from? Basically, we, we have a lot of students out here that are going to be doing freelance. They're not going to create entities right away. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a temperature of, at what point did you guys go, I need to create this entity, and, and are you currently building, billing your clients through your entity, or are you being paid as an individual? I'm an inv- individual, uh, mainly because like my tour stuff, I'm an employee of Mariah. Mm-hmm. And okay. And so a lot of the tour stuff, yeah, I'm W-2 okay. on a lot of that. So it's just an extra step to have to mm-hmm. uh, LLC or whatever through it. Um, yeah, and then on the other side, I'm just an individual because I usually... Like, I don't have to pay people out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. So the check is coming to me. Yeah. So, like, the gigs where you bring Leslie in, let's say. So you got something, you need to hire Leslie. So usually with that stuff, there is a third party paying. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I figure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Carlton? So, yeah, I have a, uh, a manager, so I get, I get paid through my manager. So she, she bills and everything and pays, pays me. So I, just basically, I kind of work as an individual. That being said, I did set up a, uh, when I was living in the states. I set up a, you know LLC, and you know that has its benefits, but I don't really really rely on that too much anymore. So, Car- Carlton is what we call bougie because he, <laughs> he has a manager. <laughs> nah, um, which is a smart thing. Um, I have a company as well, um, LLC, and I set it up. Uh, fairly early in my career. It's kind of like, you know, when when you start getting that momentum and you start really realizing, oh, I can live off these checks and I'm getting mixes and I'm getting calls for sessions. Da, da, da. Okay, let me go on and set up that company and do things the right way. Um, I have a very famous uh, history. Monique knows. I've told it in her class a million times when I first started making money. I, you know, I got thrust into my career relatively quickly and started making money and started getting checks and da-da-da. And 
this is before I had my company, and it, all the checks were made to my name, and started buying Jordans and balling, and I'm like, oh, I've never seen checks this big before, and coasting along and doing my thing, and then, you know, one day, knock, 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 who is it? Yeah, I'm so-and-so from the IRS, and I was like, Ugh. And then you let her in. I did let her in. Literally, this is a true story. She came to my, I was living in a uh, condo at the time, let her in, and she started looking around, and she was like, yeah, so we're going to have to sit down and talk about all the laws you're breaking, and you have not paid, your, you have not filed, you da-da-da, and I was like, oh. Taking inventory of all the nice stuff in his house. Yeah. So I, I that was my, that was early in my career, fortunately, mm -hmm. um, but it was a very, very interesting learning lesson of, yeah, you just can't be out here just making money and not paying the government. Like, you got to handle your taxes. <laughs> And so I got right, and I'm straight, and we're good now. And I literally just filed my taxes, like literally, like so literally. <laughs> Yo. Like I had to sign my joints a couple of days ago. My, but it's interesting. I live in Georgia, but my tax person is here in Florida. That's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. But you know, Florida too got complicated them. for this Florida conversation. Got, Florida got them cool laws, though. I like it down here <laughs> for that. Mm -hmm. Now some of y'all other laws, y'all are wild. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say, uh, and I think there's we can all agree you got to have a good tax person uh, absolutely especially for how we make money and to do these write offs and knowing what to write off cuz we're not going to know inherently everything we can write off mm -hmm. we know the obvious stuff the gear and all that but they're like my tax lady is like i mean you uber eats to your house your studios at your house right off the uber eats you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like all the those small tricks uh she got my back on all of that mm -hmm. and then with touring stuff what people don't realize Every state that I work in, so if I'm on tour and we hit 20 states, I have to file in every single state. Yep. Facts. And it is the biggest headache ever. Oh, my God. And for a minute, I was behind on my taxes because I was, for a while, I just did my own taxes. And then when I started touring uh, like 10 years ago, and then I saw like, wait a minute, like, Mm -hmm. I got to file for every state. Like, I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then I went and found, and luckily it was one of my friends I used to intern with. She's an accountant. Um, and she handled it for me and caught me up on taxes because I was behind because I was just overwhelmed for like That's two crazy. years. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah it's it's the worst. Man. Every state, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then there's other things about it too, where the dynamics of the all three of us knows the dynamics of the industry. Where I've had years where I've made a million dollars, and then the following year I made thirty grand. Yeah. And a lot of times the dynamics is. You know, one year I could be working with Pharrell, Beyonce, Cardi B, and Rihanna all in the same year. And that's a huge gang of checks for one year. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, all four of them decide they want to go on tour. And then I'm working with, you know, DJ such and such from up the street. <laughs> <laughs> and I might have one other thing. And y'all, all y'all know I'm always here on campus. So some, some years you're up and some years it's not as – and you have to learn – those patterns as well. So keeping up with your taxes and your business stuff is super important. Budgeting. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times when, when you're young, you start making a lot of money, you think it's always going to be like that. Yeah. And then, so then you buy all the Jordans <laughs> and, you know, you buy all, I keep saying Jordans because that's my thing. And you you do these things, and then you realize on the when it when it's a little low, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have bought should have bought those. those. Yeah. I shouldn't have bought those off whites. Yeah. I should have left those. Yep. Shouldn't have bought them Yeezys. Yeah. You know, you you start regretting some of your purchases. So, where um, where did you guys learn, or do you? I know you do now. Um, did your financial literacy come from experience, or did you guys get or did you get a financial advisor? Uh, my mentor, um, Big Jim, he this is the guy that took me over in the Sunday Best, and he, matter of fact, he took me over to Mariah too. Uh, he came in working under Jam and Lewis as just a young, like, knew nothing about the industry, and they signed him as a producer. And everything Leslie said about the money, the checks coming, and not paying tax, like all of that. And he sat me down when we first got cool, and he was like, man, what's your, what's your tax situation? What's your financial, what's your credit score? What's your, like, all of that, and walk me through it. And he was like, I remember I was driving a car like yours when I first started, and he kind of walked me through his process of how he paid stuff off. I still have my student loans, 
So my all of my flight time money for the most part was correcting my credit score, finishing paying off uh, my student loans, and trying to get everything. So whatever my next step was, I'd be in a comfortable place to do it. I didn't have a lot in the bank because I was just all my checks was just rent and fixing whatever had been damaged mm-hmm. over the last four or five years. Mm-hmm. So I had uh, luckily I had a mentor that he offered that and sat me down and was like, I really want to help you mm-hmm. do that. Anybody else? Oh, I was jamming to the music. I know you were. Right. <laughs> I was trying. Um, <laughs> the way I learned, um, I had this theory that if I have an accountant and I'm paying you, I get to ask questions. Oh. And so I ask questions. Mm-hmm. And I always tell my accountant, I'm not trying to do your job. I'm never trying to replace you. I ask a lot of questions because I want to know. I want to learn. So who better to learn from than the person who is the accountant? So I never understood the whole, and, and I, I know there is purposes for it. For my life, it never had to be an accountant, a business manager, a financial advisor, or so-and-so. It just needed to be one person who does the money, and I can ask that person everything. So that, that was, for me, how that worked out. So I just ask a lot of questions and learn. And like Tremaine, to, to Tremaine's point, I hang around a lot of people who do a whole lot of things better than me and who are a whole lot richer than me and I always ask them questions and I always figure I was just telling Tremaine I learned from one of the people I hang around with a whole lot uh, he's probably like 20 years older than me and you know a, a gajillionaire and I ask all the questions and I say hey how does this work and how does that work and what is an irrevocable trust and what is this and do I need to put my house in a trust and you know, how does this work for my family and what my kids and what if something happens to me? And, you know, so all those things I just keep asking. I, I, I want to learn. So. Yeah, I was lucky in you know, working, um, starting off working with uh, Leslie at uh, Dallas Also Studio. And so you know, a lot of guys around there, the engineers, were using like the same accountant. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, hooked up with, with that guy, you know, he was just like straight lace accountant. He was like, you know, you got to withhold your tax, you know, withhold from your paycheck. And so. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of was lucky just to get kind of pushed in the right direction. Like Absolutely. So and got into some good habits. He's still doing his thing in Atlanta, too. Yep. Uh, Pole? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Rob Pole. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the important questions that they should be considering when during the negotiation process when trying to determine what to charge people? Uh, I always try to get a feel of how much work I'm about to get myself into. Ab- <laughs> so... Absolutely. Because even that number that you think is like, oh, this is great. And then when that file shows up and it's like a 60 piece orchestra and you're like, hold on, bro. Hold. <laughs> yeah. Like on top of tracks and everything else. Absolutely. And then it's like five days of tuning. You know what I'm saying? Like it ain't worth it. So yeah. I try to get a feel. Some people like if it's my first time working with them, if they're open to it, I'll be like, yo, can you just send me like the rough mix so I can kind of know what I'm walking into and and to Tremaine's point I actually go take it a step further usually when a client calls me and says okay I have a mix and it's a new client and I, I don't know what to expect they always try to send me the rough they're like well let me s- let you hear the song that I'm like no send me the files send me the pro tools and because the files the pro tools files tells me how much work I really have yeah because I can hear a rough and still not determine how much work I have because I don't know how unorganized the Pro Tools is, da-da-da. And that sometimes will work in their favor. I met, a, I, I met a young lady in Publix one time, you know, petite young lady. She plays the guitar, and she said she knew who I was, and she wanted me to make her record, and she was always scared, and she, you know, was like, oh, I ran into you in Publix, okay. And I said, you know what? And she only had $700. And if you know anything about me, $700 is never a rate I would mix for ever in life. However, (laughs) she was nice. Um, She had a good approach. And I said, okay. I said, here's my email address. Send me the Pro Tools file to your song, and I'll see X, Y, and Z. I get home. I open the file. It's a vocal and a guitar. I was like, yes, I will make this $700. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for 30 minutes of work like who can make $700 in 30 minutes so sure and I, I want y'all to realize because we talk a lot and I was I, I didn't know this until we talked as much as we did you're not always going to be working on a huge project he's not always working on Cardi or something else it's those little small Absolutely. joints and those those independent artists that never really blow but consistently come to you 
And that's a consistent stream of income. So it's like once you start getting those big projects, don't blow off those little guys because they're going to keep chasing their dream. They're going to keep coming with that bag and keep they're gonna, they're the ones that's going to pay your mortgage. The other ones will pay for your vacations. Absolutely. Okay. So don't don't cut them off when you because I was like, oh, he only works on big projects. And then the more we talk, I was like, he would play me some of the stuff. I'd be like, wait, what? Yeah, absolutely. But. Because that little 700 I got kids, you know. Yeah. Taylor Swift tickets for $700. Like, <laughs> my 13-year-old, you know. So, I, you know, you could, yeah. yeah 20 man. minutes of work, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's definitely some, like, dynamic pricing stuff that goes on. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a lot of factors, like, you know, depending on if you if you like it. You know, if, if you like the project that, that you listen to, absolutely. somebody sends you the stuff. If it's really cool. And then the rate's a little bit lower. Be like, this is cool. I really want to work on this. So yeah. may want to may want to go for it. But if it's not so cool. And even if sometimes I don't like the work, but I like the person. Yeah. yeah. If I too. feel like that's a good person that's trying really hard and I want to help them. And, you know, and, and then you have those genres that you you'd like, you know, there's a whole genre. I can tell you right now, every time I get a call from that genre, I'll be like, I don't think I want to do it. Just because they, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Because <laughs> they just difficult, you know. Mm. <laughs> well, I have a question, though, for Carlton. Since you're in Japan, mm-hmm. are the rates mm-hmm. comparable to the U.S.? Are they higher or lower, like how they operate? Mm, I, I would say generally a little bit lower, but they're not bad. They're not bad. Yeah. And and do you, uh, taxes, like do y'all pay taxes in Japan? Like, how is it yeah, a lot tax? of taxes. You got a lot of taxes? A lot of taxes. Lot of taxes. Is it taxes. more than here? Um, I think so. Generally, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's just, high. It's just like they try to like slip it in. There's just like many different. There's like here's a ten percent tax on this, and there's a ten percent tax on this, and you're like, wait a minute, that ends up being like fifty percent. So, so you get paid as an independent contractor like here, and then you have to file. Is, is yeah. it the same? It's like a consumption tax, and then there's another like an income tax like with on that's taken out of mine. Then you get like there's like a pen, like a national pension and like a health insurance tax is taken out when you have to file. It. Yeah, so. And then there's like a municipal tax. Jeez. And all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Your tax got tax. Yeah, tax, mm-hmm. tax, tax, tax. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. Okay. Uh. Get an account. What you get taken care of? You get taken care of. <laughs> I was gonna say, how's your health care situation? Yeah, yeah. So you take. I mean, you go go to the go to the doctor and leave out and pay like three bucks. Yeah. See, that's what I'm talking about. We we be yeah. talking about the U.S. There's pros stuff. and cons everywhere. Yeah. It So we talk about America is the greatest country in the world, and our doctor not this health insurance bill. Yeah. <laughs> no, people this, with free This is adulting 101. In case yeah. y'all haven't figured it out. For real. The money, healthcare, all of that. Um, so an, another thing I wanted to ask y'all is, do you guys keep like spreadsheets? Um, you know, to track your money when it's coming in before you hand this stuff over to your accountant? Like, well, are you doing anything? That's probably the worst question I could ask. I, I, you know what? Uh, that's a no. I withdraw that question from no. the panel. No. <laughs> no spreadsheets over here. Yeah. My, my accountant hates me. Wait a minute, Carlton I, got some. I, I do a spreadsheet. Thank oh, you, man. Carlton. I try, I try, Thank you. I try to do like a, I, Thank you. Yeah, but it's, um, it's simple. Like, like okay, I, I have like one one sheet, have all of the sessions that I'm doing and like what the rate is. Then that goes to like a good look, a little pivot table, like like income forecast. Like, uh, okay, that's I'm probably going to build this this day. So maybe like two months later or 90 days later, maybe I'm going to get the check. So I try to income like forecast when the income's coming. So I do that. I do that in my head. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the reason why Carlton yeah, yeah. was my assistant back in the day because he was super efficient and great at everything, and I was terrible at all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, my accountants hate me. <laughs> so you guys are probably all over the place with how and I, and if i'm wrong please um with the different projects and how you're getting paid so have any of you experienced like net 30 net 60 or net 90 deal, um situations are you like i know you leslie you say you know give me half up front or pay me all up front whatever so what what kind of deals are we talking about here where y'all are getting paid with what frequency? All of the above. It's it's yeah. all over the map. It's all over the place. It depends on the person, the label, the situation. I've had situations. Just last week I had a situation where a specific artist called me, but the management wanted to pay me. And a lot of times they do that because they don't want the label involved and they don't want the label calling me for stuff. So they'll pay me just so they can have the mix. And then they just cash at me. And then... 
I have situations where somebody else wants to Venmo me and somebody else wants to PayPal. Somebody wants to wire it directly to my account and somebody wants to take 15 days to pay me or X, Y, and Z. Most of the time, at this stage of my career, and that's the important part, at this stage in my career, most of the time I make people pay me up front. I need all my money up front and then we can figure out whatever. Um, but, you know, it's there's so many different dynamics and situations. And there are labels that I do let get away with the... But none of them um, do net 30. Now, most of them, are, I'm net zero. But um, in some, the only label I know in my heart of hearts that I would let get away with a net 30 is Atlantic because they're super consistent. I've never, I've dealt with them, knock on wood, let me knock on some wood. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I need wood. Mm-hmm. Look okay. at that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I've, I've just had really good luck with them over the years, and they've, they're a really great set of people, and they pay their bills, and it's no problem. So, but when you know you have a problem client, that's when you'd be like, yeah, I'm not going through that again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it, it varies. Like when I jump from tour world to like TV, usually they give us uh, half up front mm-hmm. um, and we'll pay the band, we'll pay the whoever. And then me and my partner, when we get the back end, we'll pay ourselves. But we want to make sure all our people are taken care of. So no complaints Mm -hmm. so it's literally like if we tape the show friday uh following tuesday or wednesday you're gonna have your money if if not that friday night um so we try to be quick with it like for tour stuff um most tours use it's two third party um payroll companies that handle pretty much every tour in the world Mm -hmm. and luckily i've had the like when i jump tours from Mariah to Bruno to Tyler to Swedish House, they all use the same one payroll company. So that made life easier because mm-hmm. um, all my information was already in the system. Mm-hmm. Now, the way they're structured, the production company for that artist determines when they're going to pay you because they have to pay the payroll company. But you learn that up front. Like, it's not. No. So. <laughs> Like, when I got into Mariah World, I learned, okay, we get paid every week. Every week. So Yeah, so you okay. get used to that. Um, and then Bruno was every week. Then I, when I switched last year uh, to this different production company, and I had Tyler and Swedish House, I was like, where's my money after, like, the first two weeks? And then finally their account was like, oh, we only pay on the 1st and the 15th. Mm-hmm. So the upside to that is... Like, I got a gig coming up with Swedish House. It's like the 12th through the 14th. So I know that next day I'm going to get paid Mm -hmm. while I'm flying home. Mm -hmm. So it works in your favor sometimes. And other times, if you start working on the 15th, you're not going to see a check until the first. first. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is information. I mean, obviously, you guys have been doing this for a while. But just for the audience, these are questions you might want to ask up front. Yeah. and (laughs) Well, here's the thing. When I, I didn't know... Even this far in, I didn't know different production companies determined mm -hmm. when you got paid because I knew it was the same payroll company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I figured the payroll company pays us the same. But I I learned last year, no, the production company determines when you get your money Mm -hmm. or when the artist is running behind on money, (laughs) you don't get your money. Um, But yeah, and then everything else you said, it can be net 30, net 60, net 90. Uh, a lot of TV stuff I do, like when I'm doing music for certain networks, it's like net 45. Ugh. It's the most random. Mm. But then they always demand, like, they want your work immediately. Yeah. Because they, they it'll usually air before you get paid. If you do music for TV, you're going to be watching your work on TV while you're waiting for your check to show up. Trash. Super frustrating. <laughs> Carlton, any... Um, so unique pay situations. Not so. When I was working in in the in the states a lot a few years back, so yeah, but that was kind of all over the place. Uh, in Japan, it seems to be better. That being said, <laughs> that being said, I do I did a session in September that I've yet to be paid for. So yep. that's September. Yeah. So I'm kind of like that's kind of an outlier. But Carlton's kind of pissed about it. Yeah. He's kind of mad. So, yeah. But so who chases your money down? Um, you or you uh, or your man, manager? Man, manager does. Yeah. <laughs> Bougie manager. <Yeah. laughs> I'm chasing my money. Yeah. 
I'm sending emails every week. Uh, yeah, there was one artist where I was like, yo, it's been like three months. You're asking me to come back to do another show and you haven't paid me for the last one. Mm-hmm. And that's why when I got to a certain point in my career, I had to start going, you know what, just pay me up front. And I got pushed back up at front at first, but everybody started to realize, like, it just makes sense. Like, I've never not done the work. So just pay me up front so I can get the work done and get on to the next thing. And let's not go back and forth. But you're in a position that you can do that now Mm -hmm. for the students coming out of school. Realistically, would you say ask for half up front? Absolutely. That's reasonable. I think that's always a reasonable play, no matter what part of your career you're in, even as a very first project, first whatever, just coming out of school. I think it's reasonable to say Give me half up front. Let me do the work. And if you like it, or if when I finish, turn in. Not if you like it. Strike that from the record. When I finish, you know, second half. Because and that way, if they stiff you, like I said, you at least got half. Because it's reserving your time. Because it's your time. So, and, and there's many times absolutely. where you're like, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, you get a call to do a mix or a session or whatever. You're like, okay, I'll do it. And, and, but then you'll get, and something else comes in at the same time. But, you know, so it's like, hey, where do I start first? You know, it's, Whoever's going to give you the money. For yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to assume, but um, if you are someone receiving a royalty, <laughs> yeah. stop, Jermaine. If, you, <laughs> if you're someone receiving a royalty, how are you, and I'm going to let y'all run with this one, um, how do you negotiate that? What are you doing to make sure you're collecting your royalty? Because royalties come from different places when you're the creator. But you guys are work for hires. But you've been working with your particular artist for a while. So if you're receiving a royalty how, as an engineer, how are you guys going about making sure um, you receive that? And are any of you making sure the letter of direction is being submitted? For your artists, because y'all are working with big artists. Yo, look, that letter of direction is a whole headache I'm trying to get that signed a lot of times. Right. Um, Do you send it with your invoice? You can. Doesn't matter when you send it. <laughs> you still not gonna <laughs> sign it. They'll pay the invoice and not <laughs> sign it. Yeah, that. they'll get the money. You'll get your money before you get that signed. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, I haven't gotten any royalty stuff on the engineering side. It's all been the production, and that's still a headache of trying to. Like, I get enough where, like, I get a cool check, but I don't make enough where I feel like I need to hire an admin. But an admin would be the person to go hunt your money down right. in a royalty situation. So I feel like the additional money they would go find would be the percentage that they're taking, almost. Right. So I don't feel like do. it's yeah. worth hiring them. But mm-hmm. there's definitely, like, some outstanding stuff I have um, <laughs> with CSAC right now where... Like I did where I scored the two Mariah specials for Apple TV, me and my partner, he's on BMI, I'm on CSAC. He'll tell me when he sees stuff, I I still haven't gotten paid the first royalty check from 2020 when we did the special, a Christmas special. Hmm. So, and he's telling me like how much he's getting. Our rates are gonna be different because it's different PROs. But at this point, since 2020 till now, and it's her for Christmas, that's like several thousand dollars that's just lingering. So I've reached out to CSAC. I was like, yo, where's my money? And they're like, oh, we're not paying out on Apple TV yet. What does that mean? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that's weird. Yeah. I was like, BMI is paying out. ASCAP's paying out. Y'all haven't figured out your deal with Apple TV? Mm-hmm. So my money is just somewhere. Sitting in the ether. <laughs> in the ether. <laughs> several thousand dollars. Like, mm-hmm. I know it is. So it's a headache. I want to get an admin, but I just don't know if you want to spend the money. Worth it. Yeah, because then it might not be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the last like minute we have left before we take any questions from the audience, um, what about raising your rates? Um, at what point do you raise your rates and how do you communicate that effectively to your clients that what you paid last time is not what you're about to pay this time? Yesterday's rate. Is- <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday's price is not today's price. Um for me, I've always had those moments in my career where I knew when to raise my rate when somebody offered me more than I thought I was going to get. And then I was like, oh, 
Maybe I need to start charging that figure. <laughs> and then it starts working out. Or um and and so that that's easy that's an easier transition when you kind of get inspired by one client to start charging other clients a certain rate. Within the same client structure, like if you've been working with somebody for a while, that's when it's harder to bump up because that person gets used to paying you a certain rate. Yeah. And then that becomes a difficult conversation of, yeah. yeah, last time we did this, but this time we're doing this. And sometimes it's an easy conversation to have. Again, like with Atlantic Records, it was understood that, yeah, what I charge you for the first Cardi album, I'm certainly not charging you that for the second Cardi album. And that's because I know how she is. I know that she is going to scream, Leslie, Leslie, Leslie is mixing my records. I know I got her now. So they can't try to pull the, yeah, now nah, we're just going to pay you the same rate. Da, da, da. I'll walk and then she'll lose her mind. And so when you know you have that kind of leverage, mm -hmm. you can, I, it, that was a very easy conversation to have with Lon Ray over at Atlantic. Like, hey, so last Cardi album, yeah, we sold like a jillion records and we got like three diamond singles. And so, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and bump my rate up. And she was like, cool, what do you want? And I was like, I think, it, you know, so-and-so is a fair number. She was like, all right, bet. Easy conversation. And, and it was understood that we had an, an insane amount of success on the last album. We got, we got to get ours now on this time around. And she might not do that well on this album, but it balances out. We made a lot of, they made a lot of money off the first album, and we got compensated on the second album. So it's that kind of thing. Um, you just got to know when to have those conversations. You feel it out. Um, and, and literally when, too. You don't, like, you know, if me and the same lady, Lon Ray, she's a, a vice president of Atlantic Records, if I see Lon Ray out at a club, I'm not going to try to negotiate my rate at the club. <laughs> so you got to pick the right moment, mm -hmm. yeah. pick the appropriate moment, um, and have the appropriate conversation. And just ask the right way. I, my grandma always just say you can get anybody to do anything you want if you just ask the right way. So, and I, like we, me and my partner are having to bump our rates for the TV stuff just because of inflation alone. Like, mm. it's just the market is changing. Things cost more money. Yep. You can't pay us the same you did three years ago when things didn't cost that much. Just for us to live, we need more money. Like, everyone else is getting more money so they can survive. Why do you think you need to pay us the same you did three years ago? So whether it's a 6% rate, whatever we can get, it's, that's negotiable of what you come in with the number you want. And then, like you said, you meet somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. But you got to raise that rate because eggs is $7. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. And from a different, little different angle. So um, for all those things this guy said, but also there's some times where like, I, I feel like I, I, get, I charge a pretty fair rate. But then some, there's those times where you know the session might be a hassle or stuff might not be as organized as it should be, so you kind of pay, you tack on extra because you know it's like a hassle fee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The hassle tax yeah. is what we call that. Absolutely. Yeah, some people, when you know you're about to be dealing with certain people, the rate, it, it's funny. I've actually set an astronomical figure to try to get rid of a client because I didn't want to tell them no. So I said something insane, and then they said, okay. And I was like, <laughs> I'm happy I'm getting all this money, but also I don't want to deal with this person. Headache. Yeah. yeah, I've had that too. So It's not always about the money. Yeah, it really ain't. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. All right, so we are going to turn it over to the audience. I'm looking for my microphone. We got. I see some hands down here. One over there. Okay, there's one over there. Hello? All right, nice. Um, kind of touching base on like um, mixes, like charging for mixes and like time. How do you go about doing revisions and like, like you don't have to say your exact rate, but like in comparison, then like what percentage would you say you charge as far as your rate? And like when people ask for like multiple revisions, like oh I want this to be done, oh now I want this X Y Z, and you know. Um, yeah, and that's an important thing to discuss up front as well. You want to try to get as m much of an understanding in the upfront conversation. And um, side note, and I talk about this all the time in Monique's class, whenever I go to talk to her class, try to keep all of your communication about 
how you negotiate, what you negotiate, what you're talking about. Try to keep that communication on email or text. Try to get them off the phone as quick as possible. If you're on a phone call and somebody wants to start negotiating, try to redirect that to text or email immediately before y'all start talking numbers. Reason being is you're going to discuss all the things and say, hey, man, so this is my rate. You'll get about four revisions. And then after four revisions, you have to pay me a little more. It's all spelled out. Then you get to the fourth revision, and they ask you for revision number five, and you hit them with the, yeah, that'll be $700 more, and they start bugging out. And then all I do, I'm the king of screenshots. <laughs> I will screenshot that conversation and be like, yep, this is what I said. You see what I'm saying? It's harder to argue your case when it was just verbal. It's easy for them to say, no, nah, you didn't say that. You said, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Keep it on a text. Keep it on an email. Redirect that. As soon as somebody calls me and says, hey, man, so-and-so gave me a number. I got like 10 records to mix. When can you get to it? What's your rate? I'll be like, all right, what's your name? All right, cool. When well, I'm in the middle of a session, I could be sitting around twiddling my thumbs. But I will be in the middle of a session going, hey, man, I'm in the middle of a session. Just text me. And that way, I redirected the conversation to text so all the understanding is in writing. You see what I'm saying? And then you do ne negotiate those things up front. How many revisions, whatever you feel like is fair. Um, even if there are clients that I've said, hey, after three re revisions, we got to talk about some more money. And the revisions might be so minute that I'll let them get away with six or seven revisions because yeah. it's not, it doesn't, you know, kill me to just turn the hi-hat up a little more or pan something to the left. Or sometimes the revisions usually aren't crazy. And, so. I, and also ask them, like, in that initial conversation, uh, the del deliverables. Yes. Sometimes you may, they may have some, like, crazy deliverables, but it actually takes a lot of your time to do. So. Yeah. yeah, and what's the expectations, too? I've had people hire me to mix. At the end of the mix, they pay me. I deliver the mix, and they go. So, and then I say, okay, well, what do you want me to do with the files for mastering? Who do you want me to send it to? And then they'll hit me with the, oh, I thought you were going to master it. Yep. Like, no, we never discuss mastering. We discuss mis mixing. So sometimes the client doesn't understand the difference. They don't understand that there are two different disciplines, and I have you have to now get the song mastered, and I don't master. And then now with the advent of Atmos, that's a whole nother conversation. If you want an Atmos mix, I will mix the stereo mix. I will deliver stereo mix files, but then we got to send it to Josh Goodwin or Fabian Marichuelo to get your Atmos mix done. So that's a whole nother ball game. So it's getting all the understanding up front as much in the upfront conversation as possible. And then just kind of go with your gut too. You know, sometimes, you know, like I said, some, some, sometimes it's about the person and how good or annoying a person is, you know, yeah. so. <laughs> um, other questions? Here's one down yeah, here. You know, here's hand went up pretty quick oh, at first. Good. Right. We'll make sure we get you, don't we? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh, that's loud. How are you guys doing? <laughs> so, obviously, when, since we're starting now, kind of, we're about to graduate. Some of us are barely starting out with our careers. We hear a lot that, for now, when you're working with clients, just don't charge us. Get the experience and get the job done. At one point in your guys' career, do you stop the, we're, we're not going to do it for free anymore? Do you start charging? And if so, what will be the right rate, because obviously you guys said do half up front and then the other mm -hmm. half will get it when it's done. I would, I would say, I would counter that advice a little bit. Okay. I wouldn't say don't charge, and I wouldn't say only work for free. Yeah. I would say, I would, I would edit that a bit. I would say, you know, try to charge a little something. Try to see what you can get, what your time is worth. However, don't be opposed to doing something for free if you feel like the experience can get you a lot of education. Sometimes it's not even about what you can learn, it's about who you can meet. So weigh out the pros and cons, but I wouldn't make it a hard and fast rule to say don't charge yeah, no. and always do stuff for free. I would say try to charge, but be willing to do something for free as a starter mentality. So I would edit that a bit. You gotta eat and live, man. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll you'll know when to start charging. Like yeah. that's just something you inherently feel when you get more confident. The more records you mix, uh, the more stuff you work on, and 
you'll know, like, okay, I need to start charging folks. Like, I know what I'm doing now. Yeah. And sometimes the charging isn't always about how much you make. Sometimes it's just a principle. It's like, I'm doing a thing, you are paying for a thing. And it's just the principle of establishing that there's an exchange. Sometimes it's, it's not always about the amount of money. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. All right, hello, how y'all doing? I had a couple questions. So I'm a music producer and I'm an audio engineer. So I started off selling beats and everything but I wanted to be an exclusive producer. But when it came down to like selling beats and stuff like that, where I'm from, people don't like paying up front. So, and I started making music like, you know, with close family members and I started venturing out, but it became an issue. Like I started charging half up front and then later on, it would be an issue, oh yeah, like with the, um, per, not the production, but the engineering side of things, I would charge a fee up front and then they would be like, I show them the mix or whatever and they'll be like, oh, woo, or whatever, and then they wouldn't try to pay the other half, and I'll just be like, um, so what are we about to do about this? How do y'all send, like, say if somebody pays you half up front, right? How would you send them the mix or send them proof? Like, are you, do you just say it's okay. done, or how do you, I don't know if that's Basically a clear like question. Right, the mix. right. I've, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The I, work. I kind of fill it out at this point, because um, some people, I'll, like, the mix, like the bounce I'll send them won't have an L2 on it, so the volume will be low, and it'll be an MP3. Because if I feel like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to get this back in, <laughs> you ain't about to get away, foul, uh, until I get my check. Like some people, you you kind of get a feel for it, um, but that's kind of also the risk we take in all mm -hmm. of this. There's no guaranteed way. Like I had a client where, and as an independent artist, mixed the whole project. Uh, they were a whole headache to deal with, paid me, got everything, and then reversed the payment on PayPal oh. and was like, I didn't get what I asked for. And I was like, you have, like, I can't take back what I sent you. Like, it was a, right. it was a Dropbox link. Yeah, where I'm from, it get real, like. <laughs> yeah. And so and the other thing I This is why contracts are important, too. Let yeah. me just put that out there. Because for that situation with Tremaine, that could have, depending on the clause in the contract, could have quickly have become a copyright issue. Yeah, I copy Not them. just I a copy breach of contract, but a copyright issue, which then they would end up owing you more than what you were charging them to do the job mm -hmm. if, if the clause is drafted correctly. So this, we didn't talk about that today because it was about the money, but if you really want your money, make sure you got something in writing to hold somebody to what they're supposed to pay you. That's the other thing I was going to say is, um, I noticed you keep saying three words, where I'm from. And so sometimes when you're trying to solve a problem, you have to look at the problem differently and realize you may be solving for the wrong problem. So sometimes it's, you might need to move. Yeah, that's why I came down here, yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm being serious, yeah. You might need to deal, you might need to open up your circle of the people that you're dealing with. Um, and you may need to move because the where I'm from came up a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So you might not be, need to be dealing with the people where you're from. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's bad, that's mm -hmm. why I came down here. And, and what you accept is what you're allowing. Mm -hmm. So you got to put your foot. That's one thing I mentioned in my class, too. You got to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so maybe where you're from is not where you should be doing business. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I did, like, I copyright a lot of my beats, too. Like, uh, so I try to, like, protect that as much as possible. So I do that. Yeah. All right. We have time for one more. One more. Oh, two more. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I heard you guys. <laughs> I heard you guys mention net 45 a lot. I have no clue what it is. I would like to, you know. Uh -oh. Ask. oh, the net and the number following is the number is referring to how many days it takes for you to get paid. So if you're net 15, you're going to get paid in 15 days. If you're net 30, you're going to get paid in a month. If you're net 45, you're going to get paid in 45 days. Well, and, and if you're net zero, that literally means the minute I turn, I'm net zero with most of the labels I deal with. So if I turn in my invoice today, is today Tuesday? Like, for instance, if I turn the invoice today with Atlantic, I'm going to get paid either tomorrow or the next day. And I'll say that's the max days they can pay you. They can pay yes. you before, before that, yeah. but that's they have up to 90 days to pay you. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they won't pay you up at that 90 days either. It's facts. Yeah. One more if question. One more question. It, one more question. I think they're, he's over there. Hi. Yeah, ooh, ooh. <laughs> that's loud. Um, so I am a singer and... I have a question. What would you say, what would you recommend that we prioritize in terms of where we invest 
when it comes to our music. Like, mm, maybe don't spend too much on a music video. Spend more on mixing or mastering or or all of that stuff because that's. Mm. Um, I as a singer, your your product is you and your music first before anything. Uh, so I feel like a lot of people overlook the production, the production mm -hmm. and the mixing and the mastering and they put all their money into the visuals and everything else and it's like cool visuals but that song sucks or it sounds terrible because you threw all your money at the wrong thing so I feel like if you're an artist your top priority should be making good music and having the music sound good so I want to watch the video because I'm not going to watch a video if the song sounds terrible. So that's kind of, a, a lot of people, as wild as that is, they seem to overlook that part. They they try to undercut us on this side and then give the video director whatever they want. I'm like, for what? Like, this video is useless without a good sounding song. Bam. Oh. Well. All right, so that is the end of our session. But before we go, um, we have a wonderful gift. Um, from Foolies Clothing, uh, which is actually owned and operated by a Full sale graduate, uh, Alex Nemo Hans. Y'all might have seen him around campus. And so since we're talking about money today, this shirt, what's it say on the front? I oh. forgot. My rate is my rate. Um, and on the back it says, if you pay me what I'm worth, we all win. Facts. And your panelists were kind enough to sign the shirt, so I made it Leslie's job to give away so I didn't have to do it. <laughs> Good. You're talking about this young lady right here? Sure. Yeah. We're going to give this, you the shirt. This lovely young lady right here. Because you, you were taking notes. <laughs> she was taking notes diligently. Bless her heart. All right, we got to go. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> All right. Hey, Lucas. We good? Uh, yeah, wait for Allison's mic to get turned on. Oh. Where are you guys going to be? Do you have another... Appointment after Yes, this? Hall of Famers, we got to go. We got to go to a thingy. All right, fantastic. So, you guys, I apologize. They do have to go, but you know they will be on campus all week. Yes. So, when you see Thank them, you, make sure you go to their tent. We're oh, at the yeah. Fortress tomorrow. The feedback loop. Oh, and we're, we're at the Fortress tomorrow at 2 o'clock, 2 to 5. So, the big show Good is up. tomorrow. The feedback loop. Thank you, everybody.